Oh, yes. For great days. Great I had day. intended to bring a, a little magical illusion with me, and I put it in the wrong jacket. No magic tonight? So no magic tonight, and I also told myself that I would do what Mrs. Temple used to tell Shirley before every take, and I find I'm not doing it. Do you know what she used to say? No. This is really true. Just as they put that slate on, you know, take number four, whatever right. it is, littlest rubble. She'd say, sparkle, Shirley. Ooh. Sparkle, sparkle Shirley. Mm -hmm. So that's what I told myself behind the curtain. Sparkle, Orson. <laughs> I had a show. I was the voice of cornstarch. Oh, you're putting me on now. I kid you not. And it was one of my first really good jobs because it was five days a week. 75 bucks a time, all I had to come in was read a poem while the singing strings of somebody or other played, and I'd read this thing. And I had to write a little thing about the poem before I would read it. It was a 15-minute spot for the housewife at noon. And I had been up about three nights without being to sleep for overwork, as you may imagine. Came in one day, and it was a poem they picked for me by Robert Browning, and I couldn't understand what it was about. And I didn't know what to say about it. And I remembered a line from a play that I'd been in, The Barretts of Wimpole Street with Cornell, when she says to Browning, who was a character in the play, what does this poem mean? And he says, kind of a funny line that he really said in life, when this was written, only God and Robert Browning know what it meant. Now only God does. So I thought, I'll say this. The ladies will enjoy it. It's on singing strings. And all the sponsors, and the smaller a show was, the more sponsors would be in a, in a, of course. In a room, you know, <laughs> were gathered. And I said... Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this poem puts me in mind of what the author said originally, that when this was written, only Rob and Grab it breathing. When Grot was written, only Grab it breathing. Music continued. When Grob and Grab it... When God was written, only Rob and Grit and Gritty. And then I saw all of these faces, purple and black, staring at me. And I just put down the script, walked out of the studio, and never saw them again. <laughs> never saw them. Oh, that's <laughs> that's the September 29th, 1937 issue of Variety said that melodramatic and at times astonishing crime fighter, The Shadow, returns to the ether to probably find a rather sizable slice of listeners waiting for him. In this series, the sponsor will benefit from having a program aimed right at the vulnerability of the audience it seeks. Orson Welles, a young and good actor still riding a crest of recognition, one with the Federal Theater Project, does the title role. The shadow is a bit fantastic, but as with these things, the stunt stands muster with the show's listeners and appreciably colors the proceedings. Well done, both as to script acting and producing. Both Billboard and Radio Daily also gave the program positive reviews. A blizzard of fan mail came into WOR. Shadow fan clubs sprang up across the country. Wells would occasionally appear at promotions, donning a black cape, hat, and mask. Oddly enough, because Wells was constantly rushing from one part of New York to the other, Frank Reddick, who previously voiced the Shadow as narrator, was kept on to record the Shadow's opening signature, giving Wells a few more minutes to get into the studio. I think I should tell you about some of the actors who appeared on The Shadow in those years. There were such wonderful names as Everett Sloan, Frank Reddick, whom I mentioned before, who went on from being the narrator on the original show to being one of Orson's company. There was Paul Stewart, there was Martin Gable, Arlene Francis, Alice Frost, who had been playing the lead in Big Sister, another successful radio serial, and many, many others. <laughs> 